Hello everyone. Welcome to the seventh session of the TALC 2020 webinar series. Today our speaker for the webinar is Professor Rohit Dankar. He is a professor of philosophy of education in Azim Premji University, Bangalore, Mumbai. Professor Dankar was an integral part of the NCF 2005 process as a member of the National Steering Committee, Drafting Committee, and Chair of Focus Group on Curriculum, Syllabus, and Textbooks. He is also a part of the collaborative group of institutions that developed the MA Elementary Education Program of TISS and has been involved with capacity building of educational functionaries at the national and state levels. He trained as a teacher under David Horsberg in the Neilbach School and taught at the elementary level for about 15 years. He is also the founder secretary of Digantar, a voluntary organization in Jaipur engaged in providing alternative education to rural children with an aim to nurture them as self-motivated and independent learners equipped with the ability to think critically. We are pleased to welcome you, Rohit ji. I now invite you to begin the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, friends. Right, so we will come to the today's talk today. Uh, I mean, just now. Uh, topic I'm actually talking about today is uh, truth, justice, and peace. And I'll emphasize uh, the importance of justice and peace, the justice and truth in achieving any kind of peace. Uh, one might think that in current times when there is a lot of uh, online teaching is going on like this webinar and thousands of schools in India, uh, uh, context for education uh, might be ICT or the possibilities or imperatives of online education, etc. However, uh, it seems to me that there could be other concerns which might be equally pressing in today's uh, strife-toned world and maybe in the long run more important. Therefore, we are focusing in this webinar on peace education. As I said that I'll emphasize the importance of justice and truth, but before that, uh, a few readings are sent. Mm, I do believe that some of you might have browsed through them or read them. Uh, others will read them later on. Uh, in this talk, generally speaking, these six readings collectively give an idea of concept of uh, education for peace its content and pedagogy, and the kind of issues uh, the concepts gives rise to. I'm not actually describing the readings or explaining them. Uh, however, I'll refer to uh, these readings during, during my talk. Uh, with this little introduction, we come to um, peace. It could be said, actually, that uh, mm, peace becomes contextually significant only because there is strife, violence, unrest, danger of war in today's world. In such a context, this is sorely missed, and therefore people start thinking uh, of education as a means to enhance possibilities of peace. But actually speaking, peace seems to have been one of important concerns of humanity since the very beginning of civilization. If you look at the older civilizations and through the religious uh, scriptures, uh, it seems that uh, peace is, is emphasized almost everywhere. Uh, we all know that uh, all of Hindu pujas end with Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And uh, one can find scores of verses in Vedas and Upanishads and other Hindu Shastras, which actually pray for peace and uh, for everyone in the society, etc. Similarly, if one looks at Bible and, and Quran, again, one can find scores of verses uh, which pray for peace, as well as want to achieve peace, as well as uh, uh, 
give you direction how one can achieve peace in one's personal life as well as in society, etc. Therefore, it seems that uh, peace has been a kind of going concern uh, in the in the in the in the religious uh, discourse and religious structures. There is nothing surprising in it. Because peace is a necessary condition for flourishing as well as enjoying human life. But there is something very interesting in these scriptures when one looks closely. There are verses which, you know, eulogize peace and want to achieve peace, but at the same time, there are also prayers and uh, exhortations to believers uh, to actually annihilate all the enemies. So on one side, there is emphasis on peace, and on the other side, uh, there are lots of prayers for um, doing away with the enemies and actually complete destruction of enemies. Uh, there are prayers after prayers in, in, in Rig Veda uh, requesting Indra to destroy all the enemies. Uh, in Quran, Allah repeatedly talks of destroying non-believers. In Bible also, there are plenty of you know, verses of this nature. So what is happening? How come these two things? There could be several interpretations. I would prefer an interpretation uh, which is given credence uh, by several verses where peace and destruction of enemies occur together. And therefore, it seems to me that though the peace is desirable, but is, this is also assumed that peace and well-being for all is possible only if the view of life and social order preferred in the scriptures prevails. The very rejection of the chosen, chosen view in the scriptures is declared breach of peace and often even evil. And I think that is one significant difference between the way we are uh, looking at peace today and uh, at least uh, part of the mm, penchant about peace in the scriptures. Not all, not all scriptures, but uh, at least part of that. That today, mm, we are looking for a slightly different idea of peace. We aspire for an inclusive peace. We, where all imaginations of good life, values, socio-political order are in conversation and collectively evolve a vision that is acceptable to all. This is very difficult though. And so when we are talking of inclusive peace, which means that all the systems of value and imaginations of good life have to be taken on board and one has to rise above one's own value systems and look at the larger perspective. Now, in that context, uh, let's, let's try to think what could peace mean. Uh, in literature on education for peace, uh, this is emphasized at three levels, at the level of individual, at the level of society uh, or, or country and uh, international mm, peace between nations at the international level. Today, we will talk more about the peace at individual level and at the social level and uh, leave out the international level at this moment. Uh, Peace at the level of individual or forming the uh, dispositions and mind of the individual which is inclined to peace, is, seems to, it seems that is the only way for peace education. I believe as uh, students of education, we all know that education has no handle to effect any change in the society or in the international arena. All that education can do is help an individual develop certain kinds of dispositions, capabilities, knowledge, information, uh, 
and value systems. And the changes which happen, which are attributed to education in the society and, and international relations are because of the functioning of those individuals in a certain manner. Therefore, education necessarily works through the individual. And therefore, central point in, in peace education uh, is, the, is the individual. Uh, perhaps many of you know that there is a position paper um, on peace, uh, which was written together with the NCF. And it says that peace begins with the individual and spreads to the family, to the community, to the nation, and to the global village. Similarly, there are several documents by UNESCO, uh, particularly uh, a document uh, published in 2004, which, uh, sorry, 2014, which emphasizes uh, capabilities of an individual uh, for peace education. Uh, Therefore, individual seems to be at the center in peace education. Now, what would it mean to say that someone as an individual is at peace with himself or has the capabilities uh, to enhance peace in the society or capabilities to uh, negotiate differences and conflict peacefully? Again, there are several descriptions on the literature. There is a very simple sentence in the position paper again, that at this level, this means peace of mind or the psycho-spiritual dimension of peace. Unfortunately, I don't understand spiritual dimension very well. Therefore, we'll try to understand this notion of individual being at peace in the more common sense terms. Elsewhere in a paper, uh, by the way, peace in any sense at the individual level, we can roughly for our discussion at this moment define as absence of mental stress and anxiety. Now, what kind of individual, what capabilities an individual would require uh, to have this kind of uh, mental disposition? Elsewhere in a, in a, article, um, I have argued that this is mainly a matter of harmonious development of an individual's rational capabilities or intellectual capabilities, uh, value systems, thought processes, and capabilities of action, coupled with the goodwill for all people. So I have, I have mentioned several things. On one side, there is intellectual development. There is a development which is, which is also part of intellectual development, the development of a uh, moral framework and capabilities of action and capabilities of uh, thinking. Now, if there is a disharmony between them and my aspirations and there is a lack of goodwill and trust in other people, then it seems that one is likely to be less at peace. Uh, though this is a negative definition of peace, we will come to a positive de definition. Uh, when we say absence of mental stress and anxiety, this is only a negative definition. But when we add in this goodwill for others, and if that implies cooperation uh, with, and collaboration with others, then it becomes a positive notion, uh, roughly defined of peace. Therefore, one important aspect is that what kind of, uh, how, how can this kind of individual which has this kind of disposition be developed? Uh, internal harmony and peace seems to have two dimensions. That one is dispositions and two is knowledge and capabilities. In capabilities, I include capabilities of action as well. Action could be physical, action could also be intellectual. When we discuss with other people and try to uh, work out solutions through conversation or debate, which is acceptable to both of us, then that is also action. So action 
so it includes our intellectual work and particularly our interaction with others as well. Uh, it seems to me that in peace education, uh, disposition perhaps is more important and that disposition actually um, can be developed only through uh, reflection on oneself and others. So they are very intertwined. Uh, there is a possibility that one gets a lot of information and knowledge and still doesn't develop the, the, the disposition. On the other hand, there is a possibility that one somehow uh, imbibes that, that disposition in the, in the society, but at the same time doesn't have the knowledge base uh, to actually act according to that, that disposition. So the, the only way education can, can take, it seems, is then development of knowledge and reflection and, and the various kinds of understandings. Uh, for example, understanding of human rights, citizens' rights, cultural differences, state of social justice in the society, environmental issues, importance of education for peace, etc. All these issues might be very important. And actually the readings I have shared with you uh, enlist all that, but we are not getting into the details of that. So, uh, peace education faces a problem of definition as soon as we come to this decision or, or this kind of thinking. Because the intellectual capabilities, values, knowledge base and dispositions that are enlisted under peace education become more or less identical with the aims and content of education in general. Uh, however, at the same time, one problem, I mean, one, one of the readings uh, in the, in, with, which I have shared with you, I'm quoting from that, however, at the same time, one problem is that peace education can be seen as encompassing all educational endeavors so that peace education merely becomes a synonym for education. Now, there is a very important document in India, uh, Mudaliar Commission report. Uh, there is an, an interesting sentence in that. Uh, I'm reading from the, from reading that quote. He says, no education is worth the name which does not include the qualities necessary for living graciously, harmoniously, and efficiently with one's fellow men. But we want exactly the same thing in peace education as well. And it is listed as an important aim of education while discussing democracy. And many other people have come to the similar, similar conclusion. Therefore, uh, Therefore, what is the difference between peace education and education in general? Uh, what is new or additional in peace education? Perhaps the answer could be that the difference is mainly of emphasis and pedagogy. I'm, I'm not certain at this moment, but we will spend a minute on this. But then, does it require a separate tag of education for peace? It seems to me uh, that the lit literature though does not say in so many words, but seems to suggest that there could be three reasons for a separate tag of uh, peace education to something in, in, in education. Uh, one is the pragmatic reason to draw attention to a very pressing ongoing concern. So may, maybe there is an aim of education which is already there, which encompasses that, but that may require special emphasis in the present context. context. That is one reason. The second is that the, there might be some content which needs to be underlined more, and there might be some pedagogical changes which might be um, useful in better achieving a kind of disposition and knowledge we are talking about. It seems that, that the changes in AIMS curriculum pedagogy may not be enough to conceptually define a new variety of education, but the pragmatic need of the hour may justify a tag that seems to be the case with education for peace uh, to me. Now, uh, this brings us to the second level, which we need to 
think about uh, for peace. And that is uh, peace at the level of society. Negative peace at the level of society can be defined as absence of strife, disputes, and violent protests. But this kind of peace can become possible even by brainwashing people into the belief systems of powerful and by suppressing deviant opinion by force. Uh, we, can, we do have examples of this kind of thing uh, in the history. Prevalence of caste system can be seen as one uh, in, in India, in Indian society, can be seen as, uh, as one example of this. And subjugation of women, women throughout the world is another example of, um, of, of, of this kind of peace. Therefore, it seems that uh, if we are talking of peace in the modern times, we already talked that uh, we have to take on board um, all imaginations of good life and value systems and have to come to a conclusion which actually uh, can ad adjudicate between them and we can come to some kind of, of shared conclusion in that. So it seems that peace may be regarded as the denial. Uh, I mean, this kind of peace, the earlier kind of peace which I was talking, uh, the negative peace, uh, may be regarded as the denial of the right of vanquished to reclaim what was uh, unjustly taken from them. Uh, a peace ideology, in this sense, discourages remedy or uh, preventing injustices. That is the reason, actually, that much peace literature, I'm quoting from a position paper again, but uh, similar sentiment is found several other places, that the demands of justice must take precedence over the claims of peace, which means that one condition is that peace must be, must be a just peace. That is that just order in society uh, is a precondition you know, for the peace in society, in this sense. Now, positive peace in society requires harmony, cooperation, tolerance, and adjustment. In a diverse society like India, multiplicity of visions of good life, values, and group interests will always give cause for disputes and conflicts, which may develop into strife and violent clashes. Peace in such a situation would require ar arriving at principles and values which are more abstract and generalizable than one's own value systems, which are capable of adjudicating between rival value systems and principles, and can also accommodate the essential aspects of the group or rival value systems and principles. Uh, now, uh, to find such principles, actually, we should look at some ideals in democracy. Uh, democracy, obviously, is uh, premised on the worth of an individual, dignity of human being, equality, freedom, and justice, among other things. Since my main point in today's talk is value of truth in the social space, social peace, I will indicate uh, only those points in uh, understanding justice which establish necessity of truth. And the discussion on justice here will be rather truncated. We don't have enough time to go into details of justice. So far we have talked that if we want peace at the social level, then justice seems to be a necessary precondition. Uh, from that point of view, Let's try to look at what justice could mean of truth. So without going into details, it could be plausibly argued that a just socio-political order necessarily grants equal opportunity to develop one's region and rational autonomy to form one's judgments to each citizen. Now, this is not all injustice. There is much more. But we are emphasizing these two points. If some people are not allowed to or denied opportunities to develop their rational capability and use those capabilities in forming their opinion, such a socio-political order cannot be called just in a democracy. Also, 
any action that deliberately hinders people's development of region and forming informed opinion has to be counted as hindrance uh, in justice and being opposed to peace. Uh, let's remember these three, four things. They will be useful further down in, in, in this talk. Therefore, lasting and just peace has to be achieved only through freely formed rational opinion of citizens on all issues of controversy and strife. Two necessary conditions of being able to form rational opinion are having knowledge and capabilities to think. Without that, uh, if I do not have information, enough information on an issue, say, say some economic policy uh, or any other kind of uh, uh, issue of legislation, etc., or I do not have the capability for rational deliberation, then I cannot arrive at an informed judgment. So therefore, these two capabilities are necessary. Capability for rational de uh, deliberation is more than logic alone. It involves moral and emotional commitment to truth and consistency. Uh, truth in modern days is actually has been under attack uh, for quite some time. On the one, one aspect was that there is no certainty to knowledge. But uh, in education, actually we cannot do without the ideal of truth. And actually knowledge cannot be defined without the ideal of truth. Even if the truth is uh, not certain, together with the fallibility, acceptance of fallibility, uh, still the notion of truth survives in that sense. So the second necessary condition for forming one's own rational opinion is availability of knowledge. Often knowledge is confused with belief. Uh, these days, this is a common question, whose knowledge? This actually, among many other things, this implies that actually one is talking about belief because the knowledge has to be publicly justified in a certain sense and it has to have a claim for truth as well. So when we consider whatever one believes sometimes is deemed as knowledge. However, knowledge is more than just the psychological process of forming beliefs. It necessarily requires epistemic criteria of justification and truth. Justification is, is in having evidence and argument that supports the belief in question and cognitively convince one uh, to consider it to be true. Now, in spite of truth being a very problematic and controversial concept, as we talked, this survives this, uh, this idea uh, of uh, being a necessary condition for knowledge in this sense. That Peace in society necessarily requires a just order. Just order is impossible without respecting the dignity and independent decision making of the people living in the society. Independent decision making and judgment of the people necessarily requires uh, knowledge and capabilities to think, and therefore, ways of thinking which point towards truth and understanding of what should be considered truth. Therefore, it seems that the epistemic truth, which depends on evidence, justification, and other criteria, seems to be a necessary condition if we want uh, just peace to be established. I would argue that commitment to this epistemic ideal of truth is necessary in public discourse, aiming for justice and peace. But even more important for such a discourse is another related but distinguishable notion of truth. And that is moral notion of truth. Now, this is possible sometimes that one may have a false belief, one may have an incorrect belief, but that person expresses that belief as he or she holds that belief. In that case, his belief is wrong, but the person is telling a truth. Another possibility is that someone may have a correct belief, but hides that belief in public discourse and 
misleads other people in believing something else. This person is telling a lie. Here we are using truth as a moral concept. There is slight difference between the two. So it seems that commitment to truth, both, both in the epistemic sense as well as the moral sense, is a very important condition for achieving peace or, 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 a, or a social order which is conducive to peace in the society. Let's try to see that there might be certain kinds of public discourses in which, uh, which, which might weet the peace uh, in a very dangerous manner. The line we have already talked about two things: that when one loses, in particularly now I am talking of public discourse, when one loses uh, the epistemic rigor in arriving at a judgment in a public political discourse, then indirectly one might be harming peace and justice both. And the second, when one tells a deliberate lie, then definitely that is going against peace. Now here, an, a peculiar situation arises. We talked that uh, in arriving at a just, just order and, 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 uh, and just peace in the society, all opinions in the society all opinions of the citizens, their value systems, etc., should be considered uh, and should be taken on board. The problem is that the majority of the people in any given society at any given time may not have all the required information and capabilities to think through very complex issues. Therefore, the ideal which we were just now talking seems to be impossible in a certain sense. We have to add another dimension to this now. And that dimension is that there are certain people in the society. You can, uh, we, there are many categories of that, but three most important categories to my mind are public intellectuals, politicians, and the media. Now, in any society, this is responsibility of the public intellectuals politicians and the media personalities who have sway over other people's opinion to first disseminate correct information, which means building their knowledge base of the public. And the second, uh, give an indication or rather uh, disseminate it in such a manner that people also acquire capabilities of think through through complex issues. Do we claims or do we states that when there are any kind of public movements or political movements and unrest, there is also a dimension of mass education in that. That mass education dimension is only up to that extent that it helps change the disposition of the people towards fellow human beings and nature. Now, public discourse in any strife-ridden society actually can play the same role if these three people <coughs> or three categories of people, as I mentioned, public intellectuals, uh, the politicians and the media takes care and shows commitment to epistemic and moral truth. If they don't show commitment to epistemic and moral truth, then actually the whole thing is turning upside down. Uh, let's try to understand that the only way to persuade, persuade people in a democracy is through their own cognition, rational persuasion through their own cognition. They should arrive at a informed decision to accept belief A rather than belief B. If someone manipulates people into believing something which he or she wants them to believe and for that hides information, 
or uh, does not have commit, commitment to truth, then this person is actually attacking the dignity of the individual as well as the autonomy of the individual. And therefore is going against the basic principles of democracy. So this is not morally justifiable to manipulate people's opinion in a, in a democracy. That brings us again or re-emphasizes the value of truth uh, in, in, in a peace discourse. So we have identified two things which actually vitiate or rather weaken the commitment to truth. One is the epistemic rigor or lack of epistemic rigor and another is deliberate lie. But actually there are two more forms which attack truth much more severely and we may notice them less than uh, these two obvious forms of attack. Uh, one of them is usually called uh, political correctness. Now, political correctness uh, basically in, in its original form means that uh, there has to be some group or say, say a party. This comes from the, uh, from the Bolshevik uh, Revolution and Communist Party in Moscow. But there has to be a party if you want to generalize and it has some kind of ideological position. And if I am a member of that party, if my opinion, considered opinion is against that, then I should express my opinion in such a manner that it does not contradict uh, the the party opinion. Now this form is what we are talking. But later on another form of political correctness developed and that form is being sensitive in language not to offend particularly the underprivileged people. So the critique I am or rather mm, uh, rather accusation I am making of being against truth is not to the second form that is sensitivity of language, not to offend underprivileged people. I'm not attacking that notion of political correctness. I'm attacking the notion of political correctness, which necessarily forces people to manipulate their own opinion and express their, that in a very guarded form and express only that opinion, which is in the party line. Now, this necessarily involves manipulation of people but the greater attack is on the freedom of expression. Because when you follow political correctness, then you also attack the people who have uh, another kind of variance or of, of, of opinion. And therefore, the discourse in the society on issues is bossed up. This, again, takes away from the possibility of achieving <coughs> justice and just peace thing which, uh, or another kind of discourse which uh, attacks uh, truth in the society is uh, what Harry Frankfurt calls bullshit. Now bullshit is used usually as a term of abuse and not considered uh, a very, uh, very good term to be used in an academic discourse. Uh, in a little booklet called On Bullshit, Harry Frankfurt discusses this notion and how this is prevalent in the society. He, he claims that bullshit is much more prevalent in societies than we think. He analyzes the concept of bullshit, not as a term of abuse, but as an expression used to communicate a standpoint in conversation. Frankfurt claims that one, bullshitters are profoundly indifferent to truth. Two, they are not concerned with communicating information, though they may pretend to be doing so. Three, that they are fakers and phonies. And the essence of bullshit is not that it is false, but that it is phony, that is fabricated. And that what they care about is manipulation of the public opinion. As long as they can manipulate the public opinion, truth is not one of their concerns. 
Frankfurt argues that this understanding of bullshit leads Frankfurt to the conclusion that bullshitting constitutes a more insidious threat than lying does to the conduct of, conduct of civilized life. A bullshitter is unaware of the place of truth in society and is profoundly indifferent to it. An example of bullshitting could be uh, that whatever modern day science has achieved is already available in our 2000 old literature, including atom bomb. So this kind of thing is actually uh, obfuscating, manipulating, just trying to manipulate opinion. Uh, so there, 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 are, there are thousands of other opinion examples of this nature. Now we have listed uh, four enemies of truth. That is lack of epistemic rigor, deliberate lie, political correctness, and bullshit. And we have noted that unless until we have a high commitment to truth, we are manipulating other people, particularly the politicians, public intellectuals, and media, if they don't have commitment to truth, then they are manipulating people and attacking their dignity and autonomy, and therefore morally unjustifiable, as well as hindrance to the justice in the society and therefore hindrance to the just peace in the society. Actually, uh, the best way of keeping strife alive in the society is using these four kinds of ways of discourse which continuously uh, confound people and keep strife on. In this kind of situation then, it seems to me that in such situation, we would be justified in concluding that the most important requirement of peace education today are three. A commitment and capability to ascertain truth, both epistemic as well as moral. Two, an abhorrence and capability to spot lies, bullshitting, and political correctness. And three, carries to speak the truth in the face of dangers and ridicule. Unless until peace education includes qualities of character, including courage and capabilities to think on these lines, it seems to me this would be a kind of ideology which will go against justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rohitji. Uh, we'll now uh, uh, send some questions which you can respond to. Uh, so the first question is, uh, religious scriptures do promote peace as well as talk about annihilation of enemies. Then why do we see continuation of annihilation of enemies till date, but peace is far from our reach? Uh, actually, both are far from our reach. No society and no civilization has been completely successful in annihilating their enemies as well. But these are two different kinds of directions uh, in which not only religious scriptures, I think uh, all ideologies think. Ideologies have necessarily a vision of a society which they consider uh, would be good for everyone. Therefore, everyone's well-being, according to them, would be achieved only by adhering to that vision of good society. Now, if someone is not, uh, uh, someone is does does not agree with that vision of society, they would like to do away with that. That that idea is much more in the religious scriptures now than in anything else because religions also have this arrogance religious ideology also has this arrogance of proclaiming themselves to be the only truth and therefore uh, this tendency is there but uh, both the ideas being in the scriptures and necessarily achieving one of them is uh, is not as a, actually as a uh, is a necessity 
So both the tendencies are alive even today. Uh, we constantly strive peace for peace, and at the same time, we want to um, either convince our opinion, the, um, our op op people who have opposite opinion, into our opinion, or we want to do away with them. Now we have arrived at a level. I believe that is a moral as well as social development that we would like to persuade our uh, opposite uh, view through a rational uh, persuasion rather than by force and annihilation. And that to my mind is progress. Also, I do believe that societies world over, if you look in, uh, in a long-term manner are more peaceful now than they were say 300 years ago. Uh, whatever peace societies had 300 years ago was actually built on injustice and force. Today that is uh, more or less removed and therefore we see more strife than might have been in some societies in then. But that is a sign of progress to my mind rather than going backwards. Uh, thank you. The next question is, how to inculcate the epistemological value as well as moral value of truth among the 21st century learners, especially amidst the present condition where prevailing peace is a dire challenge? Okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, epistemic commitment to truth. Uh, I believe that uh, Usually we talk a lot about critical thinking. Uh, what actually you are doing in critical thinking is you are looking at your belief systems uh, through all available evidence and you are checking your inferences and logic and ways of thinking in that. So, uh, an important thing inculcating, inculcating uh, commitment to epistemic truth is first recognize that knowledge is different from belief. I may believe that the earth is flat. There happens to be a flat earth society. But that does not necessarily mean that I know that earth is flat. So the distinction between belief and knowledge arises out of whether I have justification or whether my belief is consistent with the larger belief system in the domain I'm talking about. Therefore, epistemic rigor is a question of examining your belief system according to the criteria accepted in the domain you are working. Now, these criteria might be different in different domains. For example, in science and mathematics and history, I was saying that if we emphasize one, understanding and not accepting any belief unless until my own cognitive process tells me to accept it. Uh, Israel Scheffler actually mm, gives a pedagogy for this or himself a pedagogy for that. He says that a teacher should propose to the student almost everything he or she is teaching to be examined by the student and the student has two rights, the right to clarity and the right to deny, the right to not accept what the, what the teacher is saying and say that I am not convinced, I do not uh, see the reasons you are giving, they don't uh, add up in my own cognitive process. So what I'm saying is that being aware of one's cognitive processes and being honest to one's cognitive processes and having courage to express that uh, seems to be the only way. The second thing that, that I have already said about the moral truth, it seems to me that the, the commitment to the epistemic rigor in truth and moral truth are uh, connected with each other. And uh, if this gives me confidence in my thinking, then it is more likely for me uh, to speak the way I think. Uh, yes, 
uh, strife toned societies and uh, various kinds of opinions which counter each other and uh, acrimony in that countering uh, unnerves one and then this becomes a little bit more difficult than usual but then it also becomes more necessary in such a situation so what i am saying is in a way trying to find some ways or give some hints on the pedagogy and content of education which might help in developing this you see nothing is guaranteed in education in education we work on the possibilities so this seems to be one possibility there might be more possibilities uh, but that's what comes to my mind at this moment yeah yes is education not responsible for personal development and molding an individual's personality and if so then why does not education focus on personal traits actually if we uh, yes education is uh, uh, responsible for personal development but let's try to think what is personal development is personal develop does personal development constitute in uh, how i look how i go for an interview how i uh, respond etc or personal development is basically development of mind and value system and confidence in my ways of thinking and uh, ways of clearly expressing that uh, this concept of personal development when people talk of personal development more as uh, uh, sometimes which which you know refer as personality development that how one um, you know once get up how one walks talks comes across with other people etc that is emaciating the concept of personal development personal development i think happens much better when one pays attention to acquisition of knowledge understanding values commitment to values and reflect on one's own behavior and ways one talks with others these are perhaps more important traits in personal development in other other words i would say the personal development is actually uh, development of mind and learning uh, ways of behaving civilly with people in a civilized manner with people uh, but maybe other definition of personal development which uh, which do some other kind of uh, of job i do not know about that uh yeah so the next question is uh, despite teachers becoming change agents who recognize past and present experiences of inequity and bias and schools becoming strategic sites for fostering emancipation petri change doesn't peace education seem to be a distant dream see the question assumes that the kind of aims and aspirations which we have from education would be realized uh, simply by having those aspirations we all know that that is not true so we have certain kinds of aims of education certain aspirations from it but to realize those aims and aspirations there are other conditions in the society in schools in capability of teachers and overall structure of and system of education which need to be met only then we can realize aims of education so if we look at our education system then maybe we are reasonably okay in articulating our aspirations and aims uh, of education but preparing uh, or providing the necessary conditions for that in terms of good teacher education adequate number of teachers infrastructure other facilities uh, and functioning of the school uh, structure of the school etc environment of the school etc may not be adequate to achieve those aims i would see it in uh, i would see the problem not in expression of the aspirations 
but more in making adequate arrangements and fulfilling the conditions uh, for the intellectual and moral development of the child to achieve those aims. Uh, we don't pay enough attention to that, it seems to me. Across to you. Thank you very much, Professor Dhankar, for this engaging and uh, insightful uh, session. And thank you all to the participants as well. Thank you, Matri, and thank you all.